All right, great. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, the session is pretty informal. Teresa and I will be here and available to answer your questions. Um, and the way that we'll go about that, assuming I can uh, work the chat functionality property properly here is, um, if you can enter in the chat that you have a question, then I'll call you in the order um, in which you're uh, submitting the chat. And then Teresa will be answering most of the questions. So we'll try and go back and forth that way. Um, and then if there's anything that uh, Chris or Dan, you wanna jump in on um, to answer, please feel free to do so as well. So we're really excited uh, to have the opportunity to have provided the data set uh, for the Soybean Data Challenge. And we are excited to see what you come up with. Um, we appreciate uh, all of the assistance and your technical knowledge um, in helping farmers to make the best decisions in a particularly volatile market. Um, we are providing the data sets. However, you'll see most of them are publicly available data. Uh, there is not much proprietary information that goes into these decision make, make decisions for farmers. It's really in how to make that data come together um, in order to understand uh, whether we should be selling or uh, holding on any given day. Teresa and myself uh, founded Farm Femmes in 2017, and so we are um, very focused on promoting modern art agriculture and helping um, those who do not have a connection to agriculture to see what agriculture looks like. Uh, it's no longer kind of the pictures that we may have had in the past of uh, antique tractors or, um, you know, that there's a lot of uh, animals running around and things like that. Instead, we have some pretty amazing IoT technology, um, robotics and dairy barns, and really wanting to make sure that uh, people have exposure to what that looks like and the skills that a modern farmer has to have, not just in understanding how to grow their crop, but also how to market their commodity once they have produced it. So Teresa, with that, I'll throw it over to you. Sure. Again, just to echo what Karen said, we really appreciate um, everyone putting their expertise behind this to try and help farmers understand the complexities of the market. Obviously, uh, basic economic principles of supply and demand are So I mean, a commodity has certainly been impacted by and the um, conversation agreement between China and the U.S. Uh, impacts that greatly. And then um, global weather patterns impact the global market. So with all of that into play, um, reference, uh, try to all of those different factors to those will come into what's happening in our Awesome, thank you. A little bit of uh, and certainly in being order to read and so in order technology up to date we need to be in order to but we need to Forward, which in turn provides the best product in order to make the best information is a little bit more about the touch to second video farming is certainly a cash flow intensive so one of the Factors is certainly flow dates necessarily term events bring that because 
sold 18 months ago. Those predictions uh, selling before even seeded. And we would open data information. So with that, if you have a question, you've had the opportunity to see each of the three videos that we have released, as well as um, the data sets at this point. So we'll open the floor up to questions. This is informal and we will stay on the line till 5 p.m. Um, so if you do have a question, please uh, submit a chat and I will um, call on you in the order in which the chats come in. All right, Waverly, you'd like to unmute and ask your question? or I can just ask it out loud. Uh, can you help us understand how the different contract months work? How are the different pr market prices for soybeans for the same historical dates different by contract month? Okay, this is Teresa. I will try to- So you might be on mute. Mm. Okay, can you hear me? No, you definitely are on mute. Good, now we can hear you. There's just a little delay between the video. That's all. Okay, perfect. But I can sell that right now for a contract at any sure. If I For March. Was that answering? They might be having trouble with uh, with the mute. Um, so, uh, Teresa. It, your audio is cutting out intermittently, so if you want to turn off your video, that might help. Okay, let's try that. That might be up videos off, so yeah, see if that helps. Um, and I just received uh, several questions from Holly Crop. So Holly, I'm going to unmute you there, and uh, if you want to uh, start with your, I think you, you had two or three questions. So if you want to go ahead and, and uh, ask your questions. Okay, I'll, I'm, she might still be having trouble with audio there. I'll try, um, I'll read the questions here through. Um, so we can approach to September, October 2019 soybean data. Shall we use it? Um, so, and then, so that's the first question. I'll just read through the whole set here. They might be related. How can we choose sell hold? Um, by all historical data from 2016, 2017, weekly, monthly, or yearly. Um, next quest, second question she submitted was, what do you mean by active soybean contracts? Can you spell, sell, explain sell hold recommendation costs? And then the third one, how, how are those active soybean contracts? March, May, July, 2020 different are the independent? Um, and could we use the actual data of active soybean contracts for September, 
for 2019, September, and October that are open online. So that's a whole series. Hopefully, uh, you got all those. Okay, this is Teresa. I'm going to try with no video and see how audio is. It's much better. Okay. Active soybean contracts for March, May, and July are, um, I would say, not. not in other words, they are somewhat impacted by the larger cycle, the overall annual cycle of production. And that cycle of production, um, the timing of that cycle differs by geographical location. In other words, our North American production cycle occurs at a different time of year than the South American production cycle. So although they can move, they move independently, but they are the active soybean contracts. I think there was one question about what does active soybean contracts mean? There's active and historical. So historical would be ones that have closed already or delivery has been accepted. Ones that are open for farmer contract. And then there's a certain period out after which they're not active anymore. So depending on your commodity, it depends how far in advance you can market your crop. Am I still there? Yep. Yep. Okay. You're good. Did that answer all of Randy those? Randy might be getting. Randy might be getting all of the messages just privately to him. So make sure and specify when you're submitting those that they are to everyone. So we got another one in the queue there from Trenton. Is there a specific method? you use to market crops, social media, flyers, et cetera. So how do you market crops is the question. So I'll, in, I'll answer that two different ways or two different inter interpretations. And then if you need a follow up question, just let me know. But for a large scale commodity like soybeans, we'll have a buyer at the elevator who you'll be in conversation with. So if we believe that it's a high price and we want to sell, we would call that buy. How do we get that information to make that decision? Um, part of it is through social media. Part of it is through direct messages. Part of it is through just listening to the news and listening to current events and weather patterns. So the physical, how do you make the sell decision is you call it the buyer at the elevator. The how do you make that decision is gathering all of that information, and that's what we're hoping that you would help us to do. Why are there, why would be <clears throat> some reasons that a farmer would choose to sell in March versus July? Um, obviously, the market price, which is what we're asking for your help in, but those other factors would be. Um, easier to deliver in July because you're not dealing with snow that you are in March. Maybe you have more um, people power working on your farm at a certain time of year, or there's more time uh, to do that, hauling of the grain to deliver that contract at a certain time of year. And um, then as we touched on earlier, farming is cash flow intensive, so perhaps you need the cash flow. Okay, the next question is, could you explain how the commodity trade weighted indexes are calculated and what the numbers mean to the worth of the contracts? Any 
And Andrew, perhaps you could clarify and send to us, are you referring to a specific column in the data? And then we'll move on and um, if you can send that, that would be helpful. Thanks, yeah. From, from Gabe, how do, and Christian, how do we make a hold slash sell recommendation based solely on the market price? I think that, and Karen, jump in if you think this is, but I'd say I think that's what we're asking you to help us as the farmer do, because that's what we are trying to do is make a hold or sell decision based on our understanding of current market prices, as well as um, our understanding of weather patterns, our understanding of the political climate, and so on and so forth. So I think that's the entire crux of the challenge is to decide how do you make that hold and sell decision. Karen, do you want to jump in? Right, and you may, part of what we'd like to see is a criteria of what you come up with as to that uh, recommendation. But for example, uh, to expound a little, if your prediction is that the price, if that's what you're going to use, uh, is you're predicting the price, if it is in the bottom 10%, uh, you may not want to sell that unless you're thinking, oh, the market is continuing to go down. So those are things that you may want to consider in your criteria of between hold and sell. All right, the next one, um, can you elaborate on what we can expect to submit? It says we're submitting 10 days per contract for three contracts, but I'm not sure what you expect in the submission. And Chris, maybe we'll throw that one to you. So yes, um, we will be asking you to make submissions for September and October. And then we will select the 10 days to evaluate your predictions against. Okay, so you're going to have to submit um, for the three different contract dates for the entire month of September and October. All right, and we will, I, what I've done in the past is probably just made a simple form. Um, we'll probably maybe have three boxes where you would submit for the three different um, futures, March, May, and July, or whatever they were. So we have not, and then there's also the prediction for the buy or sell. So we'll have to figure out, for each of those days, you'll have to make a recommendation for buy versus sell. So that'll probably be right in that same submission, a price and then a buy-sell recommendation. So to be honest, we will work through that and provide more information about what you will need to submit. Great. All right. And we won't know the best prediction until after the event. Is that correct? That we're going to wait and see, have people predict into the future like we did last year for that single element of the contest? Uh, that is true. Um, for that additional component to be announced, um, we, the organizers, I guess, will have to decide if we want to include that or have that above and beyond. So maybe like that'll be an additional prize that we could give away. Correct. And this is Dan, by the way. And, and it's it's important that all the students know that in the real world, nobody pays you or hires you to predict something they already know. The uncertainty of the world is just like this. So we want you to live with that uncertainty, and we want to reward the teams. And I will point out a couple of things. Uh, one of the finalists teams last year had the third worst prediction of the entire group. Third worst when it was one of the finalist teams. The team with the best prediction didn't make the finalists. 
that's also a reflective of the real world. <laughs> So yeah, if we're, as long as we're still on the evaluation stuff, the prediction will carry, it'll be not a majority of the weight. It's usually between 20 and 40% of the weight for the competition itself. So there's lots of other elements that come along with doing an analysis, such as how do, well do you communicate what you did, what kind of models did you use, Etc. So we will be posting a rubric, let's say here in the next couple of weeks. So you'll have at least a week or 10 days before the competition with a finalized rubric that we will be using for the evaluation step. So this is not like Kegel for the students out there or the advisors where the only thing that matters is the prediction. In the past that has carried, I think the, the highest we've ever gone is 35% on the prediction component. So lots of other elements that you need to be thinking about and working through as you're progressing through your work in the next three, four weeks here. Let's maybe move on to the question from Ryan. And Ryan? All right. Yeah, go what ahead. What do we consider to be the max or min price? Is it the max min that we want to predict for September third to October 31st, or are we basing the September sell hold recommendations on what we predict the September max min are and vice versa for October? And I can jump in on that one. Um, this is a daily prediction, so we want to have each day and you're predicting the end of day price. Um, and then what we answered earlier about the sell hold still uh, stands here and it is real world messy uh, and you were looking for your um, your thought process and logic around that. Um, and we have Waverly just uh, asked the same question. Teresa, now that your audio is a little bit better, can you explain the contract month concept again? What does the month part of the contract month imply? Sure. So we, as, a, as the farmer, you can sell at any point in time for any time into the future. And that month part of the contract is when in the future. So the soybeans that I have right now, I can sell on paper anytime into the future. And so those future months of March, May, and July are the three that we've sort of targeted for this challenge. And I can sell at say now, October or November or November for anyone upcoming future contract dates. There's kind of a related question a bit down. How long can you potentially hold before delivery? And that's entirely based on the um, holding capacity of the farm or farmer or the elevator which it's being delivered to. So there is not an expiration date so long as the crop that you have is harvested in good condition and is stored in a relatively dry, safe space. So you can store it for weeks, even months, yes. And Waverly, uh, yes, unless you're missing something, what it, won't the closed prices on the days already be public knowledge by the time we submit? Yes. They will be, and that's why we're doing 10 random selections. And if your price is exactly the same as the closed date, then we will know that it was not a prediction. Um, so the data site sets about active soybean contracts for July. Oh, I'm not sure that I understand that as a question. Um, so the, your lat, okay. Uh, maybe I'll skip that one, reread it, and come back. Um, unless I think that might be the last one. The data sets about active soybean contracts for July or any month uh, goes far back in the data set, and we're lost as to what that data is. Um, Teresa, are you, can, are you following that one as to what the question is? No, I'm going to try and reread it and see if I can.
If the question is that the data goes far back historically, that is correct. So you can sell for a contract date in the future, far into the future. So right now I can be selling soybeans for 2022 contracts if I wanted to. So it is possible to sell contracts, to make contracts, or crops that are not planted yet. So the data set does go far back. So not an answer to that. Can you retype and I'll, we'll see if we can try again. Okay, the next question is regarding the prediction. Are you prioritizing accuracy or explainability of the factors driving the prediction or to what degree for each? And I think as Chris mentioned, it won't be solely on accuracy and it just as based on the competition hasn't been in the past. Um, in terms of what a farmer wants, uh, certainly accuracy matters in terms of dollars that they're earning. So certainly that's important. Um, but you also have to have a level of transparency or trustability um, in your recommendation. Just like selling stocks, you wanna make sure that uh, you understand why you're going to sell it. You may not sell at the high, but you have to have a comfort level um, that it is close to that high that you're selling. Therese, do you want to add to that? Um, no, I think that's sufficient for now. Okay. And Megan, uh, the binary sell hold model will be judged based on how close that day's price is to the maximum price. What time period is the max price considered? And for the random days in September, are we comparing max price for any day in September? Uh, this is Chris here and we have not thought about that. Is that true group? So we will we will take that into consideration because that matters there. Like I would anticipate we'll, we're that we're going to part of the rubric. Correct. Yep. But that's a very good question, and that will have an impact on what your outcomes are. So. All right. We'll take that as an action to. Um, for Adam, why are the open and closed prices for activity tracks for May 2020 all the same? Shouldn't there be fluctuations within a day? And then a correction. Uh, it looks like that may be only for the far out contracts, which is going to be my answer. Yep, you were right on that. From Mark, what exactly does commodity exchange rates mean in terms of exports and imports for farmers? Are you asking, if you are asking about the impact of an exchange rate, the impact of the exchange rate is important and depending upon the company that you are selling to, the exchange rate is computed uh, differently. So that is a um, highly detailed question that I'm could certainly be a factor that you include, but whether that's calculated before or after the sell price that's listed depends on your commodity and your elevator. But in terms of overall uh, market and countries that you are market selling to, and the exchange rates do matter potentially in terms of global trade. So the, that's in the advanced levels that we have included that exchange rate. It may or may not impact your model, um, but it is something that does uh, affect the import and export, and therefore the supply and demand. Absolutely. So in other words, I think what you're saying is that has a, an impact at scale. Right. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, sorry, this is a restatement of the question that we were struggling a little bit with. Sorry about that. Uh, the concern was that we've provided three different data sets for March, May, and July, and the date values for all the given data is different between the three data sets. So what generates those questions? Are these past prediction data or actual values? So is the question what actually, so the contract dates are as Teresa mentioned, the dates at which you can sell your commodity or that you can sell your commodity anytime, but you can deliver it during those months. So that's kind of the difference. And in terms of uh, what generated the data that made it up those values, those are market values. And Teresa, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or I'll ask the next question. I think so those are, those are actual data values for each of those, right? They're not predicted. Correct, because the data sets that we provided were um, open, close, highs and lows for days that have already happened. So if you are looking at other publicly available data sources, you may be looking at predictions, but the ones that we provided were past. Okay. So the, that individual provided a follow-up down below, oh, okay. but for the same date between the three. So why do they differ so much between the three months? So if there's a date for, let's say, October 5th, why did the three contract dates differ so much? So is the question, might... if I want to sell on October 5th and I'm looking at a March contract, a May contract, and a July contract, why do those differ so highly? Correct. I know you kind of already hit that earlier, but... Right. No, that's fine. Over that again. We'll just... Part of that has to do with the overall cycle, and some of those are into in the thought starters in the... In the um, basic competition, but because the growing cycle differs annually here and in South America, which is another prime growing area, there are fluctuations based upon when um, the cycles of supply and demand overlap and when they don't. I think that's a generic enough answer to not point you too much in the so there was one up further. Um, go ahead, Gregory. Did you catch, maybe start there, Karen? Uh, Gregory, if I were to sell my soybeans yeah. on a contract for October 14th, 2020, would I get the price beans are selling at today or a year from now? So if you make a contract now, say today, you sell for an October contract, like if you're selling today for an October 2020 contract, that has a price that's established now and a delivery that's happening in the future. Okay. So you get the well price said. of today and you get paid then <laughs> when I deliver my beans and I get paid wherever my contract is in the future. Okay. For the December 6th prediction, if additional input parameters are needed for the models, how will those predictors be given to the model for that chosen day in the future? So just like any forecasting model, you just choose the time period where you're going out further in terms of the days that you have to predict. That would be my answer to that one. Um, I think we already answered that question. Okay, from Chris. And it, Chris, if I'm, Chris M, if I'm missing any questions, please let me know. 
Yep, you're doing uh, good. It looks like the unit on every value in the novice data set is commodity trade weighted exchange rate indexes. These values seem to be around 100 and they looked at how they were calculated, but you can't seem to understand how exactly they to be interpreted. Does a value greater than 100 mean higher value of those goods as exports, whereas less than 100 means no lower, or is it a percentage like currency exchange? So the adjustment was to make sure that over time, um, it was also uh, adjusted for as well as the exchange rate. So um, that data set is provided by uh, the USDA. So there, it should be uh, that adjustment has already been taken into account. Um, on the sheet one, there should be a description of how that calculation was done. Um, but I don't have it open right at this exact moment. I can take that as an action. From Tim, could today's price for March 2020 contracts differ based on the actual delivery day within March? For example, would delivery on March 6th versus March 21st make any difference? So the answer to that is no. So when I have a sell contract and when they actually take delivery, so if I sell today, and when they actually take delivery may or may not actually happen in March of 2020. So it's not even specific to the day. So what I get is today's price for March that month. And that's, um, that's as specific as it gets. In other words, the actual delivery in March doesn't matter. So do they have to deliver in March? Is that true? Like you can't push forward till May, can you? Um, well, actually, so the contract is made for, let's say, March, but there are circumstances where the elevator cannot actually physically take the commodity then. So then the farmer ends up storing it until whenever the elevator has physical space to take the commodity. So that's part of the, you know, transportation system reflecting matching up with the delivery contracts at the at the elevators but there is no financial difference to the farmer than if you have to hold your crop longer okay okay so does a lower export commodity trade weighted exchange rate index mean value mean better prices for farmers Hmm. You know what, Mark, I am going to go open that data set in the background while Teresa answers the next question. Okay, so if we have a model that accounts for additional Twitter data and the president tweets something horrible on November 18th that will impact December 6 predictions, there's no way that this could be taken into account as an input in our models. That that is correct. For this year's competition, we're just asking you to go out to the December 6th. So in the real world, you'd be able to update that right up till the last minute. But we can talk about that as the organizers and see, but I think that's the way that we intended that prediction to be. So there's been some questions here on that trade weighted exchange rate index. So if we can get some light on that, we will. Otherwise, that'll be something that we will make sure and discuss and push out. And that would probably be easiest. We can always do another WebEx specific to that if needed. Or we can even Put something on the web page or something to make sure and you know just make sure it's clearly communicated to all mm -hmm. so what do we have down there brandon uh well we 
Will being able to provide plausible explanations for the model by weighting more highly? Yes. So all of that will go into your your five-minute elevator speech that you give the judges. So uh, actually, a majority of the weight in determining the winners will be on explanations of what you did, slash recommendations, et cetera. So yes, you'll have an opportunity to explain what you've done. And that'll be independent of your predictions. So. And as I said earlier in the webinar, we will publish the rubric that we will be using. So it'll be clear on what we will be emphasizing. Certainly clear communication, ability to explain what you've done, those types of standard things. Ability to bring the data together. If you're in the graduate division, we'll put some, obviously some, some weight on what other data did you bring in, et cetera. Tim, should we perform our predictions in real time during the competition or have a set of all predictions already prepared? You should have a set prepared. In fact, I'll ask you to submit those before the start of being judged. So that'll you'll have to submit those before judging actually starts. And you don't know how well you did in those predictions until after the competition is over. Question by Andrew. So for the two sets of five days you are expecting a simple buy or sell for each day, correct? In fact, I want to buy or sell for all 30 days in September and 31 days in October. And then there will also be a price as well for all of those 30 days in September and 31 days in October for each of the three months, March, May, and June, or July. Yes, we will put the rubric on the drive and we can also put it right on the web page. Correct, just a predicted close price is the only thing we're asking you to predict. So don't have to worry about a min or max, just the close price. I think Karen or Teresa yes. alluded to this oh, earlier, but the predictions are going to be uh, there's a there's there's noise in this data, so um, you're going to want to be. I mean, it's a difficult problem. I guess I'll say it that way. And I do have the data set open. Um, in regards to the real monthly commodity trade weighted exchange rate indexes. So there is the note that it is based already on the geometric index of the real uh, exchange rates. So the intent here is to try to be able to um, understand which commodities move together. So there is replacement commodities to soybeans. Um, so this information gives you uh, an exchange or a weighted index uh, as to what that looks like. And so the intent is really to be able to compare that between commodities. Um, I hope that helps to explain kind of the thought process here. Um, and you'll be able to find um, what those replacement commodities look like. Um, but you can consider that if they're um, under, under 100, the index is that the they were worth less. Uh, over 100, they are worth more. Um, but really what you're trying to do is actually compare between columns as to the replacement values and or um, are any of those predictive of changing soybean prices. And I will give you a hint, they are. Otherwise, we wouldn't have included them. Um, so hopefully <laughs> that's helpful.
So it looks like the number of questions have slowed down here. It's good. We're coming close to the end of our time here. So our group has, oh, here we go. Karen, can you read that one there? Or I think I'm misunderstanding something from before. What stops us from just checking the historical data for all the days we are predicting since they happen before we have to submit? Well, I would say that's why we're also doing 10 random days. Um, so yes, you will have access to that information. Um, and there is there's certainly that possibility that you would like to do that. Uh, like we said, that's only a small proportion of what we're going to be judging you on. And um, that's also something that is fairly easy to see if your prices match the exact uh, market movement. So um, that is why we're choosing 10 random days. And um, the intent is for you not to uh, be using actuals. Um, that is, I suppose, a option that you may choose. At the risk reward payout in that type of situation is not worth it for students. So I just, we, we, we'll detect it and then that will not be good for you. So. I mean, I don't know. I'll just add to that. I don't know um, your model building strategy will be. Uh, zero points or, you know, nothing. So when you're trying to explain this to the judges, um, you're not going to get much weight for saying, well, that's what I decided to do. So the goal here is to figure out what of all these other information that you're being presented, what has an impact on that price and how might it, how might it fluctuate? What drives that? Um, and we're really expecting you to act like little, like mini, mini consulting teams. If this was a real world problem bought, brought to you, um, that wouldn't be something that you would be, you know, uh, paid for as a deliverable. Um, and so the intent is for you to gain some experience here that also is a transferable. Um, and so we really hope that you would take the approach. Uh, that this is an opportunity to build your resume and um, really show the judges what you have in terms of technical skill as well. Okay. Um, more, and, more. oops, sorry, one more comment from you there, Dan? Yep. Or I was just going to pipe in PowerPoint is fine. Uh, usually the way that works is you just bring in a laptop, you have your PowerPoint going, you set it down in front of the judges, you do your five-minute spiel. Um, you can bring in a poster board or something like that, but just standing there explaining what you did to the judges is how that works. A question. Another maybe. question what about, is, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, what are some examples of what you might consider a farmer-friendly format? Um, anything in particular that you'd like to see in terms of presentation format? Um, so I would say, again, looking at, you know, this would be something where it's a, kind of the above and beyond uh, work that you can be doing, looking at the average age of farmers. Um, typically, as a farmer, you are not sitting in, a de in front of a desk, so what's a format that works for, um, for that? And then again, thinking about what are the kind of devices that a farmer might have access to um, as they're moving through their day. Those are things for you to consider in terms of uh, what that could, what that interaction might look like. Yeah, and this is Dan. I'll add a little bit. The judging teams are formed dynamically the morning of November 9th. So people will walk in. We'll probably have 120 to 150 judges. They'll declare as that they're a technologist, a business professional, or an academic, and then they'll be paired with at least one, if not two, of the other to form sort of a well-rounded team. 
but to uh, the messaging we're here, you, you should format this like you're giving it to a uh, farmer. That would be good. It should be easy to understand, use metaphors to help explain things. That uh, Chris, I think, has actually came from Winona, one, uh, two, three years ago with an English major on the team. So understand how that all works. And be prepared if you go into the auditorium to speak in an auditorium if you're one of the final students. So that's uh, something that will happen dynamically that day. Be prepared for it. The question about the rubric, we're going to be releasing the full rubric as kind of was talked about in a few sections. So um, that will be outlined in there. And really in terms of the prediction and kind of the model building piece is something you should be paying attention to. Um, and then the last question, while predicting the price for day X, can we use all the data until and including day X minus one, or are you intending us to use only data before September? The intention is to use the data sets that were published. Do you wanna add, Chris, about the use of other publicly available data? but not the use of any private data to supplement the research? Uh, yeah, correct. So we, in the past, have not allowed people to purchase data in order to uh, get a leg up from somebody from another group that maybe does not have the ability to purchase data. So, and that might, uh, that will come out in our judging. The judges will be asked about what data did you use and how did you go about combining data and et cetera. So we'll just say that up front that publicly freely available open data, any freely public open data is can be used. Um, but as soon as you gotta start paying for it, it's going to be a big no-no. Um, just because we want that fair across the groups. Brenton asked about metrics for predictions. We will publish those when we do the rubric. So there was some stuff in there about, in the videos about maybe you get 10 points and five points. We just need to, as a group, talk through that and make sure that we, uh, that, that's certainly a good place to start. Um, we just want to make sure that we don't have a whole bunch of ties. So we might tweak that just a little bit. Some more questions coming there from Ann. All right, just one more small question about the contracts for March, May, and July. For example, in the contract of March 2020 was 11 14 2017, the date of the very first contract. And that's the date of the first contracts for March 2020 that we have available to us um, as, and that Karen and I have included in this set as part of a subscription model that we have. So yes. Uh, Will, where can I find the soybean data set for the graduate division? I can only find the data about tweets. Uh, so all of the, other folders are open to you as in the graduate division you're able we're expecting that you access the data that are in the other folders so it's kind of builds upon each other right so the tweets would be the additional data for the graduate division and for the undergrads you're going to want to be using the data in the novice division etc so use all the data in your lower division the expectation is that you use all data in the lower division I think that's all the questions that I see on my screen. Yeah, I think this is very good. So next steps, the group will just take back the feedback that we got here. 
a couple of action items that we will mull through this week. Uh, we anticipate that we will have one or two more of these webinars before the competition. Uh, one of those will be for the rubric and just the predictions and such. Um, so I don't know if we'll probably will end up being one next week and then one the following week, I think, is what we will end up having for you guys. If you have questions about the registration process, um, just look at the website. Uh, Jill, Atkins, and Dan kind of take care of that for us. Or you can contact myself, Chris Malone, here at Winona State. We can help you with the registration process. Dan, do you have other things that we need to shout out? Um, not much, just if there's any judges that have already registered that happen to get on the call. We may very well have a WebEx for judges as well, so they're more comfortable going in. Sounds good. And I see the last one more question. question then. Yeah. yeah. Will, will you, you score, score interactive? It? Go ahead. Oops, sorry. Will you score interactive visualizations higher than static visualizations? Uh, historically, if they're confusing, no, they'll score lower. So again, you are talking to a wide variety of audiences. So sometimes the message is better in a static. So the, the I, I would I would second that. Don't don't become preoccupied with the elegance of a visualization if it confuses or doesn't drive home the message. Often the simplest visualization is actually proven to win. The spring competition, the I think it was the actuary students out of Eau Claire that won, pointed at a very simple graph and said Think of this as a mortality chart. Yep, exactly. Okay, I think that'll do it for now. Thank you to Karen and Teresa for participating, uh, helping us out with the data and doing the webinar. And for the rest of you, good luck, and we look forward to another webinar in a week or 10 days from now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Randy, for hosting. Second all that. Thank you. Thank you.